We come to you just sinners uh, saved by your grace, Lord, weak and frail and needy, Lord, and yet you tell us to come to you, to come to you in all situations, good and bad, to give you prayer and praise, Lord, and we just do that now. We come and we, we praise you, Lord, for, for Lee Harkle Road making it through there and, and the good, how he's doing it with the cancer, Lord. We pray you would just heal him, Lord. Heal him of the cancer, keep it from ever coming back, Lord, and that you would just get praise and glory from it, Lord. Thank you for what Steve said with the Gideons and the fundraiser going better than it ever has, Lord, and your word going out to other places. We pray, give you thanks, and pray you just continue to bless your word going out here and across the world. Lord, we think of Jim Clark in the hospital and, and Becky struggling with uh, dealing with that, Lord. We just pray for strength for them help for them. Peace in this time, Lord. Healing. Lord, that your just hand would be made known in that situation, Lord. With Shirley and her congestive heart failure, we pray for a miraculous healing there, or that you would just be working your purposes in and through that uh, situation, Lord. We lift her up to you. We, we lift the family of, uh, well, Dick and Connie's daughter, Mary, Lord, with her passing. We, we just pray you would do great things through that and help with comfort and, and the mourning process for those affected, Lord. And when I think of that, Lord, I think of Tim Riley's family. As I'm sure they're still reeling from what happened last Saturday, Lord. We lift them up to you. Please help them. Please comfort them. And any others out here, Lord, and in the minds of our brothers and sisters here as they think of other prayer requests. I think of Haley in Pittsburgh, Lord, and all the struggles and the suffering that she has gone through, Lord, we pray you would be working wondrous things through that, Lord, giving her strength, giving her family strength, healing her, if you will, all types of good things for your glory to the praise of your grace and your mercy, Lord. And Lord, we just pray you would be uh, just getting glory through all these things, Lord. There's so many other things on our hearts, I'm sure, struggles we're going through. Lord, we lift them up to you. Please help us. We need you. In Jesus' name, amen. If you'll turn with me in your Bibles, if you're willing, to uh, James chapter 5. James chapter 5, and today we're going to be looking at verses 13 through 18. We're coming down the home stretch of James. Probably end our study in the book of James, Lord willing, next week. That's the plan. We'll see. James chapter 5, verse 13 through 18. Hear the word of God. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with a nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain. And for three years and six months, it did not rain on the earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. Let's pray. Father, as we look at this passage today, Lord, I pray you would just teach us through your word, Lord. Help us see how it applies to us. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see these glorious things in your word, Lord. Give me ability to communicate it and preach it, Lord, for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. As most of you know, this life is very complex. On one end, you have times of extreme calm. You have peace, uh, health, happiness, cheerfulness. And some of us enjoy that. And on the other end, you have times of extreme turmoil, suffering, sickness that we all sometimes face. 
And then in this area in between, you have this huge area of life circumstances and emotions that cover all that area in there. Some of us experience more on the suffering end, and we go through a lot of terrible turmoil. And others, it seems like their life is really easy. And most of us experience a mix of the two. Now, those to whom James was writing this letter today suffered as well. They knew what this was. They had times of suffering. They had times of cheerfulness. They had times of health, and they had times of sickness. And they often struggled with going to God in all those situations. We, like them, can often struggle in going to God in all of life's situations. Sometimes when things get really bad, we don't go to God. And sometimes when things are really easy and good, we forget to go to God. And James has help for us today. James will show us today that we are to go to God in all situations in life. When we are suffering, pray. When we're cheerful and happy, sing praise. And when we're really sick, call the elders to pray. Let's start first with when suffering, pray. I get that in verse 13. He says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. And we'll start with that first half. Is anyone suffering? Let him pray. The NIV says, is anyone among you in trouble? Now, if you've been with us, you see this has been a theme in James. Trouble and suffering has been an ongoing thing. What does James mean today? Right before today's passage, we saw last week that there were poor Christian farmers that were suffering. They were mowing rich people's fields, and these rich people, these rich unbelievers, are holding back the money. It was to a degree where these Christian farmers, these poor Christian farmers not getting the money may have been starving to death, or at least were struggling severely. They were suffering. In that passage, James mentioned Job. What's the significance there? What kind of suffering did Job go through? He's the poster child of suffering in the scripture, you might think. He lost his whole family. Other than his wife, all his kids died. And his wife said, curse God. She wasn't a great encouragement in that time. He, he lost his house, all his finances. Job suffered severely. And then he mentioned in that passage also the prophets. What did the prophets suffer with? They were beat, stoned, thrown in cisterns to starve to death. They had it pretty rough. So what kind of suffering does James mean here today? The whole gamut. It covers all types of suffering. And he says, if any one among you is suffering, let him pray. And then he switches to the other side of the coin. He says, anyone cheerful over here? Let him sing praise. Now, why does he say that? Why does James have to remind us of that? When things are going right, we don't need God as much, right? Wrong. And I think that's why he says it here. Often when things are going very smooth, when the seas are calm in our lives, when things are going well, we got that new job, just things are clicking, we got our feet propped up on vacation, maybe we'll say, oh, praise God, but we often forget him, or we don't go to him as much as when we're in the heat of battle, do we? We can struggle with that. God gives us a warning in Deuteronomy 6 of this, starting in verse 10. Listen to these words. And when the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob, to give you, with great and good cities that you did not build, and houses full of all good things that you did not fill, and cisterns that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive trees that you did not plant, and when you eat and are full... And we'll stop right there. What's he saying? When things are going really, really good for you and you're full, smooth sailing. And what's God say? He says this, Then take care lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. Be careful you don't forget God in times of ease. Don't think that we can quit praying in those times, quit praising Him in those times. Don't think the only time we go to God is in difficult times. But we're also to be reminded to go to Him in times of ease. Thousands of years ago, there was a man that lived on this earth that probably all of us, if we saw him, would say, hey, he's a pretty good guy, he's a pretty good man. He, he feared God and he turned away from evil. He discipled his children uh, in the ways of God. God blessed him with material wealth and, and just things were going really good for this, this man. And he was giving God thanks for that in those good times. And then one day all that drastically changed. One of, um, well, all of his children actually died. Terrible. 
All his finances were wiped out, his house destroyed. And then after that, he got extremely sick. And how did this man react? What did he say? He fell down to the ground and worshiped God, and he said this, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Those words might sound familiar to you. Who was that man? That man was Job. We're to always be going to God in good times and giving Him praise, and also when the bottom drops out of life. We should always be communing and fellowshipping with God through all of life's circumstances. And brothers and sisters, where do you turn when suffering hits? When things get really bad, do you turn from God? Do you run away from God? Do we get mad at God? Start grumbling and complaining as we've seen? Or do we turn to our Father, to God? Say, God, give me strength. Give me help. Help me be faithful to you, Father. Father. And if we do do that, how long do we stay there before we give up in prayer? Or brothers and sisters, when things are going smooth, and some of you are in smooth times right now, the seas are calm. Do you go to God continually, giving Him praise and thanks and communion with Him then? Or do you forget Him? Do you struggle? Do you move on? And if you do do that, if you do go to Him, how long before we go on to something else, someone else, that we think is better? James says, is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Whatever the state of our lives, covering the whole gamut, we're to go to God in all times, in good times, in bad times, in all times. So we can see that going to God in all times is vitally important. James starts us off here. In cheerful times and in not cheerful times. Whenever, whatever. But then James then moves on and he starts to specifically isolate in a time of suffering what we're to do. He shows us that there's a certain way we're to go to God in times of extreme sickness. And he tells us we're to call the elders of the church to pray and anoint in times of sickness. Look at me in verse 14. He says, Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Okay, so he says this. And some of you know what elders are, you know. If you're watching online, maybe you don't have elders, or maybe some of you are new and you're just not sure what a biblical elder is. What are they supposed to do? Um, I'll give you a few biblical examples. Elders are set up in the New Testament Christian church to pastor or shepherd the flock of God. Not sheep, the sheep of God, Christians. These elders were to teach and preach and oversee the church. They weren't to just show up and be board meeting elders or something like that, but they were to oversee and watch and care for the souls of God's children in the local congregations. These were to be men of God whose lives were not perfect, but overall were godly, and who met certain qualifications, such as they only had one wife. They didn't have two or three. They were self-controlled. They managed their household well, not perfectly, but well. They were supposed to be not a new believer. They couldn't be a drunkard, and, and there's other qualifications. They were to be men of God who were mature in the faith. There's good evidence that to have a pastor at the top and then elders underneath is really not a biblical concept. They're one thing in the scripture. And James tells us that when we're sick, to call these elders, these slash pastors, to anoint us with oil and pray over us. What James doesn't say, and this is a nuance, but I think it's important. He doesn't say for the elders to go looking for sick people to 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 hunt them down and say, come and we'll anoint you. The responsibility lies with the sick person, whether they want to do that. But James doesn't just say pray over them. Maybe you've caught it. He says anoint them with oil. At this point, point you might think, "Uh uh-oh, what kind of hocus pocus is this? What kind of magic is he talking about here? Anointing with oil. What's that look like? What's that mean? What's the symbolism there? Well, sadly, James doesn't give us all the specifics in the manual here. He doesn't right here. So we've got to kind of branch out. Is there any other uses of this in the book of James? No. Is there any other uses of this and examples of this in the New Testament? One, Mark 6, 13, where Jesus sent out the apostles to heal people and preach the good news. And they went out, and this is what we get in Mark 6, 13. And they cast out many demons and anointed with oil many who were sick and healed them. 
pretty interesting. But again, not a lot of specifics. So we've got to branch out further. The Old Testament, is there any anointing there? Maybe not with oil, but there's anointing in Exodus 40 and Numbers 3, where they were ordaining, setting apart, anointing priests to serve as priests to God. So although we can get clues from the rest of Scripture, it's not completely clear, but I think the idea is this. The oil here is, there's no magic in the oil that's supposed to be used here. There's no special healing power in this oil itself. But the anointing oil is seen as a physical action, symbolizing this person is being set apart at this time in this place for God to heal them. It doesn't guarantee it, but it's setting them apart. It's a physical action. One commentator puts it like this. As the elders pray, they are to anoint the sick person in order to symbolize that person is being set apart for God's special attention and care. Special attention and care. But what's all this for anyways? Well, it's for God's glory, hopefully, to heal the person. And James says the prayer of faith will heal the sick, will save the sick. Look at me in verse 15. In the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick, and the Lord will raise him up. Now, I think it's important to say here, what, what kind of sicknesses is he talking about here? Well, he said it seems like more on the severe end. He's talking about the Lord raise him up. He doesn't tell us exactly, but probably we'll, if we get a cold, maybe the first sniffle in the fall, you got a three-day cold coming, you probably don't need to call the elders of the church at three in the morning to anoint you with oil to turn the three-day cold into a three-hour cold. That probably not there. But I don't know that it has to be a cancer on your deathbed. There's, he doesn't say. But James does say that this prayer of faith will heal the sick. I looked at that and went, what? What's he talking about? Does he mean that every time that this is done, God's going to heal? Every time God will heal when this occurs? Well, no. He can't. We see he doesn't always heal. Sometimes God's purposes are not to heal us. I've heard another preacher say it like this, that if that was what James meant, that every time we prayed and anointed with oil, we would be healed, well, then we could just talk to the apostles today. They'd be 2,000 years old, you know? They would just start getting sick, and they would throw some oil on them, pray for them, and back to full health. And In fact, I, I would just be preaching this passage, and I, and I could really make this look good. I'd say, what does James mean here? And then I'd step away and say, here he is. And he'd come in and preach it to you himself. Be way better than me, right? If that's what James meant. But James doesn't mean that. It's silly. There are many examples in the scripture of God choosing not to heal people. And we can see it with our eyes. God sometimes doesn't heal people. I want to give you one example in the Bible that I think is pretty important. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 12. Starting in verse 7, listen to this. It's, he's talking about uh, the Christians in Corinth taking communion in a sinful manner. They were doing it in a sinful manner. He says this. So to, keep, so to keep me from being conceited, well, first of all, he talks about actually his thorn in the flesh. So to keep me from being conceited because of the surpassing greatness of the revelations, a thorn was given to me in the flesh. Paul was given some type of affliction in his flesh. A messenger of Satan to harass me to keep me from becoming conceited. Three times I pleaded with the Lord about this, that it should leave me. He was pleading with God to heal him. But he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. We don't know what this thorn was. It was some affliction in his flesh, in his body, I think. And God chose not to heal him. He prayed, and was, God, was Paul a man of faith? Sure he was. And he prayed, and God did not heal him. He chose not to. So what does James mean here when he says the prayer of faith will heal someone in this circumstance? There's several options. I want to isolate two or three here. It could mean, as I've heard others say, that James is the New Testament Proverbs. This could be a per proverbial saying, right? It's a, it's a good principle. We're to do this and sometimes God will heal and sometimes he won't. It's just a good principle to do. It's a proverb. And it has some merit to it. Or maybe he means... That God gives the gift of faith in this special moment where God decides that he's going to heal this person. He doesn't always in this circumstances, but when he does, he gives a special gift of faith that those praying just know that this is his will at that moment. It's a, it's a gift of God in that time frame. It's grace. And this makes sense. I mean, all of faith 
is a gift, right? If you're saved today, you've been given the gift of faith. God has given you that. You didn't muster it up yourselves. And if you're here as a Christian walking with God, God holds you tightly in His hand, giving you the gift of faith, second in, second out, holding you in His hands. So the prayer of faith may mean in this circumstance that when God does decide He's going to heal somebody, through this, and He doesn't always, but when He does decide, He gives that gift of faith that they believe it's going to occur. Because God uses means to accomplish His ends. Now, I must say at this moment, there are a lot of abuses in this area, which probably a lot of you are thinking with health and wealth and prosperity teachers and, and uh, self-proclaimed faith healers, that they just heap up guilt on people who don't get healed and they say, oh, you didn't muster up enough faith, it's your fault. And that's wicked. And there are those who are self-proclaimed faith healers that say they can just heal at will and they got this special power themselves. And yet you never see them at St. Jude's Hospital, do you? Going through there, bringing those kids out of there nice and healthy. Why wouldn't they do that, wouldn't you, if you had that? You don't see them in the COVID-19 wards in the hospitals going through and lifting them out off the ventilators. Where are they at? It's a sham. It's garbage. There's abuses of this. And I want to put that before you. But James and I am not talking about faith healers here. Or that you didn't muster up enough faith if you didn't get healed through anointing with oil and prayer of the elders. That's not in this passage. And there's some who think that this doesn't even apply anymore. That God doesn't heal like this anymore. That there's a restriction to the apostles in this time period with this passage. But I don't see it here. So where does that leave us? So on one end we have in the Bible examples that God is not healing certain people sometimes for His will. We don't know why. And we see with our eyes that he doesn't heal people. But on the other side, throughout the scriptures, we see a lot of healing occur. We see the blind given sight. We see paralyzed people jumping for joy, walking around. We see all kinds of things. The dead being raised, per se. And you, hear, and you can also hear different stories, some of which are fabricated, but of people getting healed. Maybe you know somebody that was healed of some type of sickness in a supernatural way. So I think the point is this. It isn't always God's will to heal us in this world. He'll heal us in the world to come perfectly. It's not always His will. But sometimes it is His will. Sometimes He does will to heal us here and now. And knowing that God does heal people sometimes. And knowing this direction from James to us through the Bible. And knowing that He calls us in times of sickness to anoint people with oil and pray over them. It should give us hope. It should give us confidence. That although he won't do it every time, that God still heals people. He may choose to heal us of our physical sicknesses and illnesses. It may be his will. And that should give us hope and not keep us away from this. God does still heal people today. Now, several years ago, I became very sick. Some of you know that. I had a thyroid disease that was destroying my thyroid. The doctor, I went to the endocrinologist, he said there's no really hope. It's going to destroy itself, and then we'll put you on Synthroid the rest of your life. you got two options. Depending on what you choose, you might die, because you can either monitor these levels, and if they go too high and we don't catch it in time, you'll stroke out and die. Or two, on the safe side, we'll just cut your thyroid out, put you on the medicine, and you'll be good to go. And I thought, wow, two excellent choices. That was a difficult decision. I didn't know what to do. So before I said, yeah, cut it out, I said, let's just, let's just monitor it. Give me some time to think and pray about this. And that's what we did. Ashley and I were praying about this, seeking God for wisdom. God, are you going to heal me? Or like he does, he uses medical intervention sometimes. You know what I mean? Modern medicine is excellent. So should we go that route? Or God, are you going to heal me? Or what should I do? Because I don't like knives. And I'm stubborn. But sometime after that, Ashley came across this passage, this very passage in James. And she told me about it. And we've read it before, but it just popped off the page to her. And she goes, Ryan, did you see this? Yeah, I've, I've seen it. You need to do this. You need to go to the elders and ask them to anoint you with oil and pray over you. Let me see that. Is anyone among you sick? Well, yeah, I guess I qualify there. I might stroke out at any moment. Let's go on. Is, is, uh, let him call for the elders of the church. Uh, all right. We have elders too. I'm still 
going along with you here. I thought, okay, so far so good. And let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And I said, wait a second. I'm checking out here. That's wacky. Not doing that oil? I mean, plus the St. Paul's, we're old school, right? They don't do that kind of wacky stuff here. You kidding me, Ashley? They'll kick me out. And then I looked and I go, yeah, but it's in the Bible. And then I'm like, no, no, I can't. I'm back and forth, but, 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 trying to think. But Ashley kept saying in a godly way, soft-spoken, she was relentless on me. Ryan, it's here in the scripture. You say you believe the Bible. It's right here in the New Testament. So I kept praying for wisdom. God, please give me wisdom that I don't have to do this, right? Now, just give me wisdom. What do you want to do? And then one morning, we were here down in Sunday school. And she's down in the Sunday school area. I think it was in the nursery, maybe. And she sees on the wall a verse of the Bible. Now, it probably been there for years. I don't know. We, we just never noticed it. There was a verse on the wall of the Bible. And guess what verse it was? Yeah, it was this one. Call the hours of church. I thought, well, how did that get in here? She goes, Ryan, go down and look at this. So I went down and looked at it. And I said, I mean, how, how could you fight that anymore? Okay, Lord, you got me. I see it. Now, I'm not advocating pray and don't do anything until it's written on the wall. Don't take me out of context. But I thought, okay, I'll do it. So one, I went to Pastor Howard and I said, Howard, you know, and I was scared. I'll be honest. I was really scared. I was like, hey, uh, <laughs> I got to talk to you about something here, you know. And, um, you know, there's a verse in the Bible. You know, I've been sick. Yeah, you know, there's a verse in the Bible in James. And then I probably started stuttering a lot. And I just blurted out, okay, would you do this? And he said, yeah, yeah, we'll do this. We've done that before, I think he said. Yeah, no problem. I was like, wow, praise God. So one snowy winter day, I'm not just painting that scene, it was actually snowing. This is a true story. We went to my apartment where I lived in Bedford, and I sat on the ottoman on the living room. That's the cushion that you put your feet on. And, and the elders, my wife, my mom, I think, maybe the deacons, I can't remember who was all there but surrounded me, and they laid their hands on me. I think Howard anointed me with oil, and they prayed that God, if he willed, would get rid of this thyroid disease, that he would heal me from it. And nothing crazy at that point. The, the roof didn't open up and the stars twinkled brighter, or the ground didn't start to shake like an ax. Nothing crazy like that. But it was at the end of their prayers. They were praying. It was just like God gave me a peace. Just like He didn't audibly tell me or anything, but I just knew I'd been healed right then. I just knew it. It was the craziest thing. So what I do, I went back to my doctor, the endocrinologist. Let's see what happened here. Test it, doc. So he tested it, and he says, wow, your levels are normalizing. Now, he didn't say, I've never seen this before, but you could tell he was very confused. He, well, I just, you know, well, it'll go back bad. I guess we'll keep monitoring it. And I said, doc. And I thought, he's going to look at me like I'm crazy. I said, you're not going to, you know. The elders at my church prayed over me and anointed me with oil because I felt I had to give God praise like I do today. God healed me. He looked at me nuts, and, and, I, and that's the last time I went to the endocrinologist, the thyroid specialist, but I've gone back to the doctor, my family doctor, several times, and they see that, and they go, oh, the thyroid history. I say, yeah, test it again, doc. And just keep testing it. And every time it comes back normal. This thing should have been destroyed or I should be stroked out by now, but it's normal, healed. God healed me. And this still amazes me to this day, even as I was reminded of this, I often forget about this, I was making this sermon, but should I be amazed? Should I be surprised that this occurred? No. James says, is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let him pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. Now God could have chosen on that autumn and not to heal me that day and we still give him praise. But well, for some reason he did. I don't know why. Maybe for this sermon here to give you guys some confidence in him and his healing power. I don't know. I don't know why he does. I don't know why he heals this person and doesn't heal that. I don't know. It's his choice and it's his will and he is good no matter what he does. But I do know this. We need to have a more healthy, balanced view of healing. Because some of us are way on this end that God doesn't do anything anymore. He doesn't heal. We read the Bible and that's it. He can't go be a... It's just nothing. It can't do anything. He doesn't heal. Then we have the other, the heretics and the false preachers who are naming it and claiming it and bobbing it and grabbing it and punching people in the guts to heal them and all this wickedness. And that's not right. We need to get a more healthy, balanced view of healing. 
I've heard it said like this, somewhere in our prayers we must find a balance between never expecting God to heal and requiring Him to heal on every demand of ours. We need a balance. That brings me to the question, brothers and sisters, any of you watching this, any of you in here are really sick? Is God stirring up your hearts to say, wow, maybe I need to do this? And some of you maybe disagree and say, well, I don't believe in that still. And that's okay. We can agree to disagree. But some others of you, maybe God's stirring up your hearts in this way. You're thinking, maybe God will heal me. And I just want to put out that invitation that the pastor, the elders as one are here for you. We're willing to do this and to see if God may heal you. Because he may do it, he may not. But he says, come to him in faith. I want to give you some confidence there. But James doesn't just leave it there. He doesn't just give this directive. He adds at the end of verse 16, confess your sins. And this is going through our final point. Confess your sins. That's odd in here. Verse 15 and 16. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray to one another that you may be healed. Part of this praying in this context of elders is confessing sins to each other. It's interesting, but it's also dangerous. Why? You've got to be careful. There's abuses here. James says there may be, may be, not is, there may be a correlation between our sins and certain sicknesses that we have. He says, if he has committed sins, not he has. Where do we see an example of this? I got ahead of myself earlier. This is in 1 Corinthians 11 in Corinth, where they were taking communion in an unworthy, a sinful manner. And Paul says this, starting in 27. 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-seven. 27. Whoever therefore eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Let a person examine himself then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without discerning the body eats and drinks judgment on himself. And here is the key. That is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died. You guys ever read that and thought about that? Paul says these guys were taking communion in a sinful manner and God was making some of them weak, sick, and killing some of them. Ouch. But on the other side, we have Job, right? Hannah sang about Job today, mentioned Job. We have Job, the poster child of suffering. Did God say, Job, you sinned in this way, now I'm going to bring sickness? No. No, we see behind the scenes that that had nothing to do with it. And Job suffered so much. So the point is this, our sicknesses may be a result of our sin. They may be, and they may not be. But James wants us, when we are sick, to evaluate our hearts. To see, is there any sins we're holding on to? Because some of us just get diseases. We're in a fallen, sick world, right? Right? Some of us just get thyroid diseases. Some of us get older and get sick and, you know, our knees blow out or we get cancer. It has nothing to do with sin that we're in. We're in a sin-stricken world in general. But he wants us to evaluate our hearts. And in times where we're sick, if there's sin that we see that he points out that we are holding on to, to confess it to him and to others. In the context of this prayer. But at the same time, he says, therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another. He expands it. It's not just in this anointing with oil and praying with the elders. He expands it to where this should be a regular thing that we do in church. We should be, as we fellowship with each other, brother, sister, I've been struggling with this sin. You know, I want to confess it to you. Pray for me. We should be praying for one another. When we're sick, we should just be praying for one another. All the time, we should be praying for one another. This should be a regular principle in our church, of confessing sins to one another, confessing them to God, praying for one another for sicknesses, and just praying for one another in general. And when was the last time you or I confessed a sin to one of us in here? Maybe it was today, maybe it was yesterday, maybe never. How often do we regularly pray for the sick in our churches? Regularly do it. I'm guilty of not doing that very regularly. How often do we just pray for our brothers and sisters in here? for strength through this life of suffering. So what does this all really boil down to? It may seem a little bit all over the place. I was looking at this. What's the main thing, James, you're getting at here? And again, he can't come in here. He's with the Lord now. 
it boils down, as it often does, to Christ. And in this sense, it's communing with Christ. I think fellowship with Christ. Why do I say that? Because we commune in fellowship with Christ when in times of suffering we go to Him in prayer, right? We fellowship and commune with Christ when life, the bottom drops out of life and we go to Him. Or when smooth sailing, we're, we're going to Him, giving Him praise. We're fellowshipping and communing with Christ then. And when we confess our sins to Him and each other, we're communing with Christ in a way there as well as Christians. It's all about Christ. It's all about His grace. We need Him for everything. I mean, think about it. For those of you in, that are Christians in here, you by His grace went to Him in faith, trusted in the Savior for sins to be forgiven, and He's forgiven you. But it isn't something you just leave there. It isn't now I don't need Him anymore. You need Him every second of every day. We need to continually go to Him day in, day out, hour in, hour out, second in, second out, millisecond. Can you get any less? All the time, continually going to Christ in all of life's circumstances. And I think that's what James is getting at here. We need him for everything. So go to him in everything. And today we've seen that we're to go to God in all of situations, to commune with Christ in everything. In times of suffering, when the bottom drops out of life, and in times of ease, when the seas of life are calm. We also see that when we're in times of extreme Sickness that we're to call the elders to anoint with oil and pray that God may heal us in those circumstances. And we're to confess our sins in all this context as a regular principle and pray for one another. And we've seen that it all boils down to communing and fellowshipping with Christ continually through this life. So I want to leave you with this today. As we leave here, be reminded to go to your precious Savior in good times and in bad Go to Him every time. Go to your Savior and sustainer of your lives. That's what He desires, and that's what we need. He holds out His hands to us at every moment, saying, Come, come. So let's go to Him. Let's pray. Lord God, we pray for wisdom. I pray that this would minister to the hearts of your people. I pray it would encourage them, Lord pray would challenge them. I pray that, Lord, we would get more in your scriptures, Lord, me included, and just have more faith in you, Lord. Help us just to drive close to you every second of every day, Lord. And when we start to go wayward, as we often do, bring us back. Pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Our closing hymn is 170, Ferris Lord Jesus. 170, if you'll stand and belt this out loud for the Savior. <laughs>